Hello and welcome to another Wannabe Entrepreneur, the podcast about what's really like to bootstrap a company. My name is Tiago and uh, I'm here again for you to share about my indie journey and I really appreciate you coming by and, and listening to me. I was, I was even today actually sharing on Twitter and I tweeted something in the lines of Forget about YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. No audience is as loyal as a podcaster's audience. I mean, it's incredible. The fact that you show up every week to listen to me, no matter what. That's unbelievable. Really, really. I really appreciate that. And uh, I mean, I, I just hope that I, I'm able to deliver the best content possible. And if you have any feedback for me, I love to meet you. I, I People send me messages all the time. <laughs> now I feel like a star all the time, not like maybe once a week or so. <laughs> but I love that when listeners come and, and give me advice or feedback or some pointers, whatever. So at WB Tiago on Twitter, you can DM me and I'm always open for to speak with you for sure. And uh, today's episode, I mean, I think today's episode will be a little bit more philosophical. As you know, I have some lines, like I know what I'll be talking about, but I never know, I don't have a script, so I'm just talking and it can go either way. Sometimes I have like a new idea and, and I just start speaking about it. But today, like so much has happened in the past week, actually, here in Portugal. First of all, we got kicked out of the World Cup and I know like a lot of you don't care about football or soccer, whatever you are in the world, uh, this, this changes. But I don't know, like for me, it was, it kind of hit hard. Like it was harder than all the other times. And uh, I think kind of, it was the end of an era. And I want to speak as well about that, like termination, like termination of cycles and how that reflects as well in our indie, indie world. So that, that, that's one thing. Then like in Portugal, I have like started to tell you, like, in Portugal, we are having crazy floods, really, really crazy floods. And yesterday, I was almost like washed out in the car. So that was so scary. I think that that I want to share this with you. Maybe it's not totally connected with the indie world, but bear with me. I think it will be a very interesting uh, topic to discuss. And then in the in the indie world, something more um, at your level, something that you actually want to listen to. I will be sharing some updates on the community. I'm trying out something really cool, something new. And uh, I, I'm a, really excited to share that with you. And I'll give you a review. Finally, the review on Flutterflow, the no-code tool that allows you to build apps for both Android and iOS. So I'll give you a proper review with my experiments and, and uh, my experience as well with that. And yeah, that's basically it. And then we also have, of course, our sponsored product, the new indie product to share with you. So yeah, as you can see, again, another packed episode. Let's get started now. Let's go. If I could only give one advice, one single advice to a starting indie hacker, it would be to speak with their users. As you know, I've interviewed many indie makers, and th there's one thing that is quite common between the success cases, which is they all build their product together with their users. For example, Simon, when he was building FeedHive, he told us he created this chat group on uh, Twitter with core users, and they were trying the products from the beginning. He was actually brainstorming features with them even before they were built. Another example is Michelle. Michelle, at first, she made a mistake. She and the co-founders, they made a mistake when building the Robinhood for Indonesia. They thought this was a problem. They tried to build it. It didn't work. But then they started speaking with their users, and then they ended up building Typeform, which is very successful at the moment. So, for sure. And that's why, as well, the audience-first approach works so well, because it kind of forces you to build in public and, and to speak with your users. And when I say speak, it doesn't mean necessarily that you need to have one-on-one -on -one conversation. This helps for sure. One-on-one -on -one conversations helps a lot. But you can also use your audience, your social media. One thing that I use a lot on Twitter are polls. They just work really, really well. 
For instance, I can tell you that people prefer espresso to Americano. I was asking, hey, what, what type of coffee do you prefer? They said espresso, Americano, or uh, cappuccino, and most people voted for espresso. I know that this is kind of a side note, but I was so surprised. Like, why? I mean, I know that here in Portugal, actually, when, when you go to a coffee place here in Portugal, if you ask for a coffee, they will give you an espresso by default. But in Germany, and I think more in, in center and northern Europe, they mostly will give you uh, Americano. So I was so confused. Anyways, like, you get... You can learn so much from, from these kind of polls, and I use this to somehow understand better my audience and understand how they think. And I'm not necessarily speaking in a one-on-one -on -one scenario with them. I, I still do that, as I said. For instance, with the Indie Lottery, Joao and I, we are always sending DMs to potential users, indie makers, and I always ask, like, can you give me feedback? And they do. And it's really, really great feedback. We always write everything down. And I mean, when you're building something, let's say that you, you build a product and you are working on the landing page, right? And the landing page is quite important. It's something that we always stress a lot about because it's our touch point with the user. We need to convince them that we are going to bring value to them. We need to grab their attention. One thing that it's crucial, share your landing page with True friends that can give you feedback. Not the true friends that, uh, like like uh, your family, they'll be like, oh, it's so amazing, I love it. No, like people that will really, if it's shit, will tell you it's shit. You know what I mean? That's that's important. It's really important. One thing that I do is, uh, in the community, we have this um, WB community, right? I mean, you, you should know. You're a listener of this podcast. I always speak about it. One thing that I do is I there's a group called the Feedback Channel, and I just share the landing page, and I ask for, for the feedback, and they give it to me, and it's super eye-opening. One one other use case that I it comes to mind recently, Jean and I, I mean, I, I think we work really well together, and I I really appreciate the fact that is, he has a lot of patience for me, because I feel that I'm always fluctuating. Sometimes I, I think, the Indie Lottery is the best, it's the best product in the world. Sometimes I think, oh my god, this is terrible, let's do something else. So, I don't know, it, it needs to be really patient. But one thing that we're kind of discussing is, we have a little section on that page where you you can become a sponsor. A sponsor of the Indie Lottery, that's how we make money. And I told them that we needed to underline that text so that people know that it's a clip, click, clickable uh, section. And then Juan said, no, we don't need it. We don't need that. And uh, we were going back and forth with that. He was like, Tiago, I am the designer. I will tell you, like, please. It's like, okay, let's take a screenshot and share it on the feedback channel. And let's see what people say. And here, it's really important that you don't skew the results. Just be as abstract as possible. What I did was I took a screenshot of the page and said like, hey, where do you think you can click? And I didn't say anything about the sponsor section or any section really. I just said like, where do you think you can click? And they said, I think you can click in this button. I think you can here. And actually a lot of them said that uh, it was noticeable that they could click in the sponsor section. So yeah, yeah, João, you won. It's not about winning. Well, anyways. <laughs> It's, it's really important. I mean, we are biased because we know our products. We know what it's supposed to be. I mean, we built it. So we have this blind spot. It's really, really important uh, for, for you to share it and, and get external opinions. So today, and this is a perfect bridge, by the way, to, my, to the sponsor section of this episode. Today's sponsor section is an indie product. It's called Magic Website Lab, and it's built by a fellow indie hacker. His name is Yanis. He is a professional web designer, and his whole business is to help you to improve your website in order for you to better reach your goals. And he offers a lot of different services and features, but today we'll be speaking about one which is called the Website Audit where Yanis will basically do a full analysis of your web page and tell you what you can improve. And as you know, in, in this sponsor sections, I always try to give a personal review. In a lot of the products before, I have actually used them myself. This one, I didn't have the chance to use, but actually someone that I know really well, João, the co-founder of Indie Lottery, he actually acquired this service and 
what I will be giving will be basically is on review. I asked João, why did you acquire it? And he said, well, my father has a website. My father has a business. And the website has really, really great traffic, but the conversion rate is really low. So as a Christmas gift, I decided to do this website audit so that we try to improve this conversion. So first of all, really, really nice, really nice gesture, Jerome. And uh, this could be a great Christmas gift, I guess. But uh, I asked him, what do you think? Is, is it worth it? Did you like it? And he was very pleased with the results. So Yanis took the time to do a proper video where he shared the screen and really point out the places where João could improve, where the website could become better. And a part of that, he also delivered a document with everything written down. So it's really a full in-depth analysis. And I asked João if he was actually applying what he has learned. And he said yes. And then he proudly showed me his SEO stats and uh, point out that everything was green now. So really, really good. In the end, Juan told me that he was happy because instead of being him spending the time to do the analysis and to learn about a lot of concepts that he didn't know, he paid someone, a professional, to do that for him. And now he saved tons of time and his father will be happy this Christmas. If you want to try out the website audit or any of the services that Yanis gives on the magic website lab.com, you can use our code WB podcast will give you 15% on all the paid products. The links and the codes and everything as well as will be in the show notes. And if you want to be sponsor of this podcast and get your product featured, as well, the links will be in the description and I'll be happy to speak with you. That's the end of today's sponsored section. Now let's get into philosophical topics. Let's start with Cristiano Ronaldo. And I bet like a lot of you just pressed pause because I, I kind of realized that a lot of people don't like Cristiano Ronaldo. I don't know. Like, okay, maybe I kind of understand. Yeah, I kind of understand why you don't like it. Anyways, here in Portugal, I think it's safe to say that almost everyone loves him. And why is that? So you might be thinking, what, Tiago? Like, do you love football? Is that it's just like you're a big fan? It's like, not, not so much. I mean, I like, I, I grew up playing football. Right, I'm, I'm Portuguese after all, and that's basically the sport that everyone plays. So I grew up doing. I was never really good at it. I I enjoy watching. Like I, I've been watching almost all these World Cup games, but in general, I, I have a team that I support, but I, I I don't care too much about it. But I think Ronaldo has crossed that barrier where he's not only a football footballer. Right now he is. Kind of a Kardashian kind of thing, right? He's super famous. I think he's one of the most famous people on the social media in the world. Now, I know it depends where, where you're from, right? I don't know if you are from a country like the US or Germany with big population. I mean, US and Germany still quite different. But in Portugal, we are only 10 million. We are only 10 million. We are a very, very, very small country. And there's a lot of things that I notice that are the reflection of being such a small country. For example, we don't have much content that we generate ourselves. If you want to listen or watch something in Portuguese, you hear from Brazil. I remember growing up and watching all my Disney movies when I, I couldn't read the subtitles. I listened to them in Brazilian Portuguese. And there's many, many other aspects of being a small country. And I, I don't mind that. But there's always this part of you that thinks that because you were born in a small country, it's harder for you to achieve things. And maybe some of you are thinking, come on, Tiago, it's a European country. You are privileged. Yes, I am. I am definitely privileged. I'm not saying that I am not. I've met a lot. A lot of my friends actually from other continents and, and places where it's much harder to thrive than in Europe. So I know that I'm privileged. But I don't know, like the fact that I see one of us, like a Portuguese guy, he was born in, in the island, like super poor, and now he has reached this amount of fame because of his hard work, 
because that's another thing. He works really, really hard. I mean, he is 37 years old and he's still playing at the highest level. Not a lot of players do this. So I was sad. I was sad when we were kicked out of the World Cup, not only because we got kicked out, because, but because it's the end of an era. Maybe some of you saw the images of Cristiano Ronaldo crying in the end. And I know he cries a lot, but I don't know. I feel that here in Europe or... I don't know. We are not very good in dealing with cycles, with end of cycles. We always get very sad and we always think that we are going to go back to that life. I don't know. Part of me is thinking, I know Cristiano Ronaldo will come back and at 41 he'll be playing the World Cup. It'll be the best ever. But no. I mean, we need to accept that things come in cycles and these cycles have a beginning, uh, climax, 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 and an end. I don't know how to deal with that yet. I mean, we we don't know. Like right? we're really also bad dealing with death, and and I I don't know, but I believe that in other cultures people accept this much more. And if you are from one of those cultures, please reach out to me because I would love to learn more about that. For me, I see Cristiano Ronaldo as kind of an idol. It opens up the possibility of me, a Portuguese person, I can do something that matters. I can impact the world with my work. Maybe with this podcast, maybe with a project that I make, but it kind of shows that it's possible. So dealing with that end, dealing with the whole story around this World Cup, how Ronaldo is not good enough and blah, blah, blah. I don't know. That really brought me down because, yeah, I just I don't know how to how to deal with that. I don't have any conclusion for this topic. I just want to share this with you so that maybe you can reflect, think about it. And maybe DM me, tell me, how do you deal with the end of a cycle? Do you think that you will live forever and your project will be amazing? Or do you know that, okay, uh, now I'm focusing on this project and it's okay if this doesn't work. If it's, it's also okay to go back to work for others and then maybe return. It's okay to have different stages in life. And speaking about impacting and bringing impact in the world, I really believe that we should be doing more about climate change and sustainability. As you know, my first app, like the the way I started this podcast was talking about change it. Ooh, change it. Now some of the listeners were like, oh, I remember. Ooh, I remember that project, change it. Many of you are like, what is change it? Well, change it as a climate change app was my first project. It was the one I started with in, in my indie journey. And it's something that I was and I am still very passionate about. Unfortunately, it didn't it didn't kind of make money. It's still there. You can just still install it. But it's an app to help you live a more sustainable lifestyle. We just need this. We need this. Everyone, please, if you have an ideas, ideas on how to make the world more sustainable, you need to do something about it because things are getting crazy. Here in Portugal, it's raining nonstop for the past like five, six days. But really raining. You know those classic movies where you have this romantic scene and you have a couple and they're about to kiss and it's pouring rain, like they are under a shower. Yes, that kind of rain. And of course, this has brought crazy floods. Floods that I've never seen before in Lisbon. It's crazy. You see cars being washed away and tunnels completely underwater. People have died already. So there's casualties and everything. I mean, it's absurd. And I was, uh, me and my partner were driving the car at night and suddenly starts raining and raining and, and the road we're going starts to, there's water coming out. There's water and we we feel it and we see some cars stopping and suddenly it's crazy. It, 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 it changed in a matter of minutes. At some point, 
I, I, I don't know. My, my car just transformed into a boat. <laughs> I don't know. I felt that like I can, I could not continue in that road. I immediately found uh, another road that was in a higher level and I turned that way and I said, okay, let's stay here because things are getting crazy. I was shaking really nervous. Five minutes after I go back to that road by foot just to see it and it's mayhem. There's cars already being washed away and uh, there's cars that, I mean, I guess they broke down because people couldn't drive there. It was so intense. And it's something that I've never thought I should worry about. That I, I'm just like casually driving and suddenly I, I need to worry that I will drown or that my car will be washed away and I will just lose my car. Is that the world we are living in at the moment? Where you are driving and suddenly a wildfire can can just pop up out of nowhere? Is that really the world we want to live in? I mean, it's crazy. We are not prepared for this. I, I didn't know what to do. Just for you to understand, I was really nervous. And my partner, she was also very nervous. And we called the firefighters. That's the first thing I thought. Okay, we need to call someone because this road, like they need to stop cars from coming to this road. I called and one firefighter picked up and it was very calm. It really helped. It really helped when when you're nervous and then someone picks up, even though if they are not there with you, just the fact they are so calm and, and they give you solutions, it, it really, really helps. So he told me something that it did, didn't even cross my mind. He asked me like, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Lisbon. And he said, okay, then just take another road. I was like, uh... Is that possible? <laughs> in my mind, all the roads were blocked. I couldn't imagine. Like after seeing that, I couldn't imagine other roads. And it's like, yeah, that's possible. And he, I, I told him where I was, and he kind of indicated: you go here, you go there. I mean, it was amazing. Great, great job. Congrats to this firefighter. I don't even know his name, but really, congrats because he calmed us down, and we end up end up going through like another road and we we were able to get out of there and we yeah everything was smooth after that but it kind of made me realize that i was not ready for that i don't know how to react in case of floods and or this kind of natural slash and natural disasters so we definitely need we indie makers we need to build something for this we need to build something to prevent to control to become more sustainable and as well we need to be like this is already a reality. These kind of catastrophes are already happening, and we need to find ways to inform people and help people. Like now, there's a, a few web websites here in Portugal, and even to be honest, the ones that are doing the best job here is Google, because you go on Google Maps and they show you everything really well. The websites in Portugal showing where the casualties or not casualty the, the um, incidents are happening. They're terrible. They just don't work. You don't understand them. We need to build better apps and infrastructure and everything because, yeah, climate change is a reality. So, I mean, that this episode is getting really, really dark. <laughs> I'm really sorry for this. Let's, uh, let's change, change topics a little bit. Let's go back to the community. It's, it feels weird not to speak about, like, this This was a terrible transition. This was a really bad transition. I'm sorry for this. But, yeah, I, I just, I wanted to share this. It's something important. I wanted to share this with you because, I mean, as I said, loyal audience, I love you. Oh, my God, I said it. Anyways, let's, uh, let's speak about the community. Let's speak about something different to relax, a new experiment that I'm doing. My community, for the ones that do not know, it's a Slack-based community for indie makers. It's a place where you can go and get feedback, support from other makers. And one thing that I've noticed recently is, as I told you, November was a terrible month. Really, really bad. No one joined the community. Only people left. December started better, but it's still not great. I need to get more people in our Slack. But I don't have a lot of traffic. On my pages, I, I use Twitter. I use a lot of ways to kind of bring some, I, I like to call it passive traffic. But it's working, but it's not great. I have a, around 30 to 40 people visiting the website every day. But I did notice 
One thing curious, I notice that the conversion rate of people that go to my landing page and end up clicking on the join button was around 24%, which is really amazing. I mean, especially for indie products, 24 is really good. Bear in mind that I, I'm not announcing that it's a paid product or the price. So, of course, it makes a lot of, like, makes a huge change. And I've tried both ways. I tried having the price indicated in the website and not having. And for sure, when you show that it's 10 bucks per month, even though it's not too expensive, people won't click on it. The first iteration I had was you would click in the join button and it would open the Buy Me Coffee platform with the possibility to subscribe, with the price and everything. This was a terrible solution. And you're probably thinking why, right? First of all, I have no control. I don't know what's happening there. What are people doing there? I don't know. So that's one of the reasons. Second, it's like breaks the experience. I show the landing page. People understand where is the community. They are excited about it. They click and then bam, they go to like some random website that they were not expecting. Is a no-go. The second iteration I did was, okay, let me create a payment page, those classic payment pages, where you see all the features, summarize and everything. And I, I show the price as well. So that's what I did. This improved things a little bit because I could control it. I could see that indeed a lot of people, 24% of people go to the payment page, but then almost no one clicks. And this is also not good. I mean, I'm losing all of this 24%. I should try to find a way to retain them. So I was coding all day, all night, you know. This is me coding. And I introduced a mind-blowing feature, a game changer. A read-only access. I know that Slack, at least the, the free Slack, doesn't offer this, but I created it with the bots. I actually took this idea from Nomad List. Sorry, Peter Levels, but it's a great idea. So now... When people click on join, they immediately go to our Slack. Uh, maybe it's still not the best experience again, because people are not expecting this. So maybe I should change to join Slack so that they know that a Slack will Slack page will pop up. Yeah, it's a great idea, by the way. I'll do that. Anyways, they immediately join our Slack group and they join with read access. And then I did an integration with Stripe where what happens is if you try to type something it deletes, so you can type first, but then my bot will delete it and it will send you a message saying, hey, you only have read access. If you're on the right, you can become a member and I'll send it a link and this user can then become a member. So this link will open a Stripe payment link. They click and it's everything integrated with my Slack. So then they have automatically, they have the, the right access and they can also control and cancel the membership from Slack. So it really took me some time to build this. But at least now, I already have seen three or four people joined with read access. No one converted yet. Now, the question is, will the conversion rate to pay users increase or not? I don't know. <laughs> I will let you know. I will let you know. I started doing this this last week. I still don't know. But I'm very excited about this. I feel that this is the way. Because now people can see... Maybe I'll try to do something to retain them, or maybe I will just say, hey, these new users popped up, and I will ask the, the members, the current members, to say hi, so that they get they feel that they want to write back. I don't know, something like in, in those lines. But I don't know, I, I like it. Another thing that I've been uh, thinking about is to start actually doing partnerships or actually hiring people for the community. And I know it's kind of crazy because I'm not making enough money to hire people. But the event we did with Ida was so good. And these kind of events really boost the morale and I can see the engagement increasing. So I would love to have someone to help me organize these events. And I, I was still thinking if this makes sense or not. I will give you more details once uh, it's more certain. I just wanted to share that... Uh, that's fact, and that's basically what's happening in the community. The other projects are are like the indie lottery. We are I haven't done much, unfortunately. Joan is working really hard. One thing, by the way, that we did that it was really a game changer was Joan and I were if there was one thing that was troubling our co-founder relationship, 
was the fact that he's really into design and he wants everything to be perfect. And I'm not. I'm the opposite. I was like, I don't care about design. Just make it nice, but doesn't the margins don't need to be everything perfect. Like that's not a priority at all. And he was like, ah, but yeah, we were having recurrent discussions about that. So I told him, okay, João, we will meet and I will teach you Git. I'll teach you how to push your code. And then since he knows a little bit of uh, CSS and again, he has great drive, you'll do it. And he said, perfect. Yes, give me access. So I gave him the full access and that was the best thing we did, really. Now he takes care of everything of the design. I implement more the the structure of it and I make it in a way that it's somehow not super ugly, but it's not perfect. And then it makes it perfect. It makes these little corrections and media queries and everything. This was amazing. So now that part is done. That was basically, I think that was the best thing that happened for the Indie Lottery in this past week and maybe ever. <laughs> really, really good. So if you have a co-founder, give them access. Really, don't be the one between your co-founder or your employee, whatever, and their goals and what they want to achieve. Just enable them. That's so much better. So really, really happy about that. My freelancing. My freelancing is, is an interesting story. My freelancing is an interesting story because, as I suspected, I, I missed, I completely missed my estimation on how much work the working with this no-code tool would be. And this is terrible because I made a budget and now I don't want to increase the budget, but I've been working a lot with that. There's a lot of roadblocks. But let me give you now, and it's, I prom promise, the last topic I will speak in today's episode. Let me speak a little bit about Flutterflow. So Flutterflow is a no-code tool or a low-code tool, I guess, that basically allows you to drag and drop boxes and implement a bunch of widgets that create apps. Apps for Android and apps for iOS. When this client first approached me, he told me that he wanted me to do it in Flutterflow, or not in Flutterflow, really, in the no-code tool, at least. He was first speaking about Thinkable, but then I kind of realized that maybe Flutterflow was better because he wants to have control over it. He wants to be able to change the copy and the design and everything. And I totally get it. I totally get it. It's it's really great for, for this kind of work. It makes a little sense. I build it and then he can maintain it and I don't have to always... It's the same situation I had with Drone. I don't have to always be, okay, change this button, change this. He can do that. So that was really a good call. But I always get nervous. Okay, I don't know what are the limitations of this tool. Flutterflow, as the name says, converts or uses Flutter in, in the backend. And it really, you can just extract the code. So that's a, something cool about this. So you can just drag and drop, install the widgets, and then you can export the code, and then you can continue in Flutter. So that's a really, really cool feature. When you first install Flutterflow, you have a free trial or not really a free trial. You have a free version of it. But to be honest, you cannot, you can do anything. You can build the app, but you cannot export the code. You you cannot ex deploy it automatically. You cannot use the code outside of the tool. So you can use the tool for free to build the app, but you cannot export. So you will eventually have to pay for it. And the prices are... I, I don't know. You tell me. The the price, there's three tiers. One is the free tier. The other one, I believe, is around 30 bucks, And the other one is around 70 bucks per month. And this one gives you full access to basically all the features. You can uh, download an APK and you can automatically deploy, which is really cool. You click in one button and deploys in iOS and Android. You can download the code. You can do a lot of interesting things. There's a learning curve for sure. There's a learning curve. And I think with, with this, all these tools, there is a learning curve. Don't think that you can just go there and do the GPT kind of you speak and it will just generate the text. No, you need to understand. And I really believe that you need to understand the basics of coding. You need to know what an API is, what a REST request, what JSON is. So you still need to learn. Maybe you don't need to code per se, but there's some 
learning curve again. So that's for sure. Uh, mm-hmm. let, let me just go through the more complex features that we had to implement um, and tell you how we did it. First of all, we call an API. So we have a backend service that is connected to the database and we need to call it and show it in the list. The, the way you do this, actually there's two ways to do that. One way is you can create an API call and there you just put the endpoint, you put the parameters, everything is in a nice kind of widget form where you you put everything and say, okay, this is the, the request. You make the request and then you can use JSON path to kind of edit. And I didn't know this. I didn't know what JSON path is or was, but it's basically a syntax that allows you to filter through JSON. You can uh, do if statements. So you can say, okay, go through all the keys and the keys that are named A, don't show them this kind of stuff. So you can do this kind of filtering and then you save this REST request and then you can call it from the quote-unquote front end. So you can just basically drag and drop a bunch of containers and you say, okay, generate this container for every item on the API response and that's it and it it works. So of course that understanding this took me some time, but now that I understand it's super easy to do it. And so that's definitely something really cool. One other thing that we had to do was to connect the app directly to Firebase, to, to basically a database. But since Flutterflow, I guess Flutter was created by Google. I don't know. But Flutterflow has a great integrations with Google and you can just integrate with Firebase. And that part really works well. I mean, you just have to follow the documentation, click here, click there, but you can easily connect with with your uh, Firestore and access all the documents and everything. And then basically to showcase that on the app, you just do the same as it was an API. You generate an item for um, each document in your Firestore. So that part really works well. And there was one thing, one little feature that really tickled that uh, that developer part where you think, oh, this is nice. There's a, a button where you can just say abstract this API call with a Google Cloud function. So instead of you putting all the, the keys that you need in the app to connect with the database, you can just click there and it will generate a cloud function directly. So it abstracts all of that. So that's really, really cool. Then you have a lot of other integrations. There's one thing that is cool about Flutterflow is that you can actually build widgets using Flutter. So there's a marketplace of widgets that were built by the community and you can just import them and and use them. You can also just generate your own. And then Flutterflow already has a lot of integrations. For instance, we wanted to implement a subscription so that people, they would have to pay to have access to the app. And uh, you can do that because Flutterflow has an integration with RevenueCat and as well Stripe, but for this we used RevenueCat. And again, it's just a matter of following documentation, following documentation, and then everything is set and we we have the the subscription implemented. That's that's basically it. That's, I know, that's one more thing that we had to implement, which was the push notifications something really, really important. Again, also just follow the documentation and uh, it works. So I'm happy with that. It seems now that everything is super simple, but there was following the documentation, as you know, can be quite tricky sometimes because sometimes it's outdated. Sometimes it just doesn't work the way the documentation says. So there was a lot of struggling a lot of connections that I had to do. I needed to connect with the Play Store, but then the Play Store, uh, I needed to have access, then my client had the access, and then oh, there's a lot of things that just didn't work out of the box, and I had to figure out why, and that's that's really annoying sometimes. Sometimes it's better to just take time and actually code things that you control than to spend your time hunting for bugs and little edge cases that are not working and and reading Stack Overflow. 
in general, so far, I'm happy. I still didn't deliver the, the project fully. Uh, we're still on that. But I will give you an update once I do so that we can see how my client uses it and if he's actually able to edit the app himself. That's it. That's it for Flow the Flow. If you have any questions, send me a DM at WBTiago. I'll be happy to answer you. And that's also everything I have for you today. The episode ended up being quite big again. I know it's uh, Wednesday probably for you now. I'm recording this on Tuesday night. It's actually already crossed midnight, so it's already Wednesday. I'm sorry for that. I always try to uh, release these episodes on Tuesday, but I don't know why. I, I, I'm not able to do it in, for the past weeks. Anyways, the, day, the official day for the freestyle episodes are still on Tuesdays, but sometimes they are a little bit delayed. Now, just let me give you the closing remarks. If you want to support this podcast, you can become a member of the WB Space and meet all the amazing indie makers in our Slack channel. It's 10 bucks per month and you'll be also supporting this podcast. I would really, really appreciate that. Besides that, you can buy the merch. We have t-shirts and shirts and mugs and everything so that you can buy that and you can also sponsor the podcast. All you need is in the show notes together with my twitter so that you can send me lovely messages this was another wannabe entrepreneur see you next time i don't know about you but ChatGPT is already a tool that i use every day it's crazy